You're listening to the Omni Athlete Podcast, your source of peak performance techniques and actionable practices from the world's highest achieving mind, body, and spirit competitors. Join host Rich Walkoff, longtime NFL sportscaster for the San Francisco 49ers, on a journey to access your peak performance state and unlock sport as a transformational human experience. Welcome to Omni Athlete. All right. Well, Ryan Redondo, I'm going to use a word to describe you, and it may be off-putting. I'm going to call you a prodigy, because not many people have accomplished as much in a short amount of time in the world of whatever pursuit they have. And for you, it's tennis. 15 years old, you're a professional. A lot of people are still with babysitters at 15, and here you are on the as a pro. So yes. take me back to the day. Take me back to the day. How did you get so good so fast? Or were you born with it? Um, I, you know, I think I was blessed with uh, some genes in my family to play tennis. Um, I come from a huge tennis family. My father was a, a tennis player and baseball player. But um, yeah, when I was born, he was the head coach at San Diego State. And, um, you know, I had my uncle Walter was number one in the world in juniors and a great professional. My aunt Marita Redondo. I uh, was a top 20 player, played all the Grand Slams. So it definitely runs in my family. And, and I started when I could start walking. Um, so that's where it all started. Yeah. Okay, so you had you had the nature and then you had the nurture. And uh, How do you reconcile those two aspects, what your gift was and your ability to parlay that? Well, I, I still do. I mean, I love tennis and I literally, like when I say I was walking, right when I learned to walk, uh, I mean, I would stay at, at San Diego State with my dad at practice. And while the team practiced, I was just on the wall hitting all day long. And when they were done practicing, I was begging the players to practice. I was, I was asking my dad. So there was this, just this passion for tennis. I just loved it. You, you didn't have to ask me to play. Um, you had to ask me to leave and I was usually crying. So, you know, from a very young age, it was this unbelievable passion. Um, I had great guidance from my father on how to play the game, and he really molded uh, my technique and, and my uh, competitiveness and, and everything that comes with high-level tennis. He did that at a very young age. Um, so, so far as I think I was reading a baby card when I was born, my mom had, and he had something like, welcome to the world, Ryan. We're so blessed to have you. Uh, make sure you focus, stay concentrated. So from a very young age, it was, it was you know, driven in me that uh, there was this uh, depth to tennis for me. Well, that's, that's awesome. So you had it in your DNA, literally, and yeah. then to have it cultivated from an early age. Uh, but it doesn't always work as favorably and as successfully for you as as for many others we see so many uh offspring of great athletes who aspire to follow in dad's or mom's footsteps and it doesn't pan out that way i mean i mean jerry rice had a had a son who was trying to make it in football and it didn't work to uh, it, it didn't work well for him and and there are so many examples of guys who don't follow in their parents footsteps but tell me what was so key for you to well you, you you did say later in life that you had a bit of that teenage burnout but but your ascension in the sport seemed pretty uh pretty solid and steady from the early ages yeah yeah you know i was extremely competitive um i was very good so i think that with the um accomplishments i had you know just the love grew and and getting to travel i mean at 11 years old, I think I was in Florida for the first time by myself with the USTA um, training, you know, and, and so I felt this, this, wow, I, I'm really good. And, um, and I'm around really good players and coaches and I'm traveling. And so it was just exciting, you know, and, and uh, to continue to play these big tournaments all over the country. And then at 13, you know, I'm, I'm going on a jet to France without my family and I'm going to go meet the, the team there to play the World Championships. And they're going back to that time. Um, you know, there's 5,000 people in the finals of this event that my partner and I are playing. And how, you know, at that age, how could you not love that? And it was kind of like an addiction. I love this. I want to keep doing this. And 
And when you're entering those places competitively inside, um, the love and the passion just keeps growing. And that's what happened to me um, early on. And I, and I really just, again, that passion comes back. Sure. Now, having the gift and having the passion and having the skill set, those are all, you know, key ingredients. But how about the mental fortitude, some of the gifts that your parents passed along to you to deal with the adversity, the challenges, the daunting pressures that you faced at an age when most kids were wondering, you know, who's going to be, what, what, what's my next video game or whatnot? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, the drive that my dad instilled in me to compete and to compete hard um, was, was brought on at a very early age, you know, 10 years old, 11 years old, um, that you better compete your butt off. And that's, you know, there's no non- non-negotiables with that. You go out there and you give it all, you know. And so um, there was a lot of uh, uh, pressure and drive to make sure you go out there and compete hard. Um, and so I had that from my father, you know, at 11, 12, 12 years old, I remember playing a match in Florida um, at an age up. And the kid that I was playing was probably already about six feet tall, you know, and I'm, I'm still only five, seven, but I was even smaller. And I was intimidated. And after the match, and I lost that match just by intimidation, that was not acceptable. And so from an early age, I, I got this, okay, there's not, there's things that are not acceptable when you go out and compete and ways to feel. And so that drove me for a long time. And so when you, I think when you include the talent that I was given and um, the strength that I had and all the physical capabilities, and then, you, and then you're driven with this, uh, this fire, uh, you know, you, you do really well for a certain amount of time. And then from there, you know, it, it does fade and you have to be able to go within, you have to have the men- another set of mental skills to get through them. Now, I'm curious, when you said losing wasn't an option or failure wasn't acceptable, was it something that your parents told you or that was an inner fire that burned within you? Because obviously the backlash or potential for you to rebel, revolt, or bail is great if at an early age you felt too much pressure, undue pressure to win or else. Yeah, I think it was a combination. So it was, you know, if I played my butt off and I, I was very professional and I gave everything and lost, um, those are, that's okay. That was fine. You know, that, that was understood. Uh, it wasn't okay with me from a very early age, though, because I just grew up with this fire and this fight. You know, it was going to be a dog fight and the competitiveness was there. So um, that was from an early, very early age. Yeah. So you, you heard the distinction between inspiration and motivation. Inspiration is you're reaching for something and motivation, you feel like you're being pushed. How would you characterize what you were experiencing as a young tennis star? Yeah, absolutely. I, again, a combination of both. Um, you know, early on, you know, after about, you know, about 12, 13, 14, and I won the national championships in the U.S., so, you know, it, that was me, you know, and, and so when I was at the top of my game there, I was pushing myself and, and I had a good understanding of how to be successful. So I don't think it was a, a huge motivation thing at all. Um, it was always, you know, my dad did a great job of dangling the carrot ahead of, ahead of me, of inspiring me. Of, this is how good you can be and, and showing me me and believing in me, my potential. And that's right. what such an early age I got, you know, my first professional ranking and, and um, was able to compete like that. Tell me about your mindset as a 12, 13 year old playing against the other phenoms of the day. Yeah. When you go to bed the night before, how much mental visualization, how much positive mindset you had to have, or did you carve out a mental game plan? Or did you just say, you know, I practiced these many hours, I'm ready for this moment and just let it all go or, so, or just uh, maybe a mix and match of that. Yeah. Thinking back, you know, 13, 14, I think that was a really crucial age for me. Um, one thing about 13, 14 years old is I start I started to develop full body cramps. So I remember uh, being in Paraguay playing down, you know, down on the river down there in this huge tournament and passing out because I was just full body cramp and waking up in a hotel. And that happened quite a bit. 
And I think that that had a lot to do with tension. That had a lot to do with the night before being too motivated and, and all of these kind of things that these kids go through. Um, at the same time, I remember about 14, 15 years old, being introduced to relaxation and being introduced to visualization, meditation. And that was, um, that changed things for me about 15, 16 years old of how to cope and how to um, visualize and handle pressures differently. And that kind of started to really turn the way I wanted to compete, turn the way I wanted to live. And that changed things about that time, that age. Well, wow, that's fascinating. So you had kind of an early crisis of confidence or challenge to your, your path. Yeah. And rather than walk away or bang your head against it, you, you turned to help. You, you, you sought help. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and it came with, uh, came with a lot of pain. Full body cramps. Uh, I had a, a knee surgery and, um, at 15. Um, that was, you know, it's big. I was at the time of my junior playing career where some of my peers are going on to play junior grand slams and, and they're traveling all over the world. And I was set back a little bit at that time. Now it was a blessing now that I see that because that's where you know, my mother introduced me to, you know, some Indian philosophy and meditation and visualizing to heal. And that really just changed a ton, a ton for me. Yeah. When you say full body cramps, you're not just talking about the manifestation of dehydration. You're, you're talking about something that went beyond that, maybe mentally and psychologically, in addition to physiologically, that your body shut down. Absolutely. My body shut down, full body, you know, on the ground, having to, you know, ambulance coming. Um, and it was, you know, now that I look back, it, it has so much to do with with puberty, so much to do with my body, very strong, very uh, muscular, but at, at the same time, it was definitely emotional. Um, and I know that now as a coach, because when my players are starting to cramp, I can see the emotions, the nerves in them producing these cramps. And so looking back at a 13, 14 year old that, you know, at the time probably felt he had the weight on his shoulders and he had to become this, you know, the next number one player in the world, because that's what he was hearing. It was, um, it's a lot for the physical body to handle. And then, you know, I'm playing in Paraguay, playing in Florida with the heat and all those kind of things that added to it. Uh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now, how did your parents respond to all of that? Supportive, empathetic, I hope? Yeah, absolutely. Very supportive. Um, with all of that, very supportive. With the surgery, with, you know, when, when it came down to those kind of support things and the human things, um, I had, it, you know, especially from my mother, she was always the, the one to put things in neutral and say, Hey, you know, you can be so much more. You, you have so many opportunities in life. You can do whatever you want. Uh, my dad being my coach and being my dad, he was the driving force, you know, especially on those early years. And, um, you know, our relationship was hard at some times, but at the end of the day, I could always go back and, and, it, you know, and I think back at the end of it, he was always supportive. Right. So you had the nurturing mother, as which is pretty, uh, pretty uh, much uh, what we see in many of the maternal instincts of, 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 of moms. And then you had the driven, ambitious father and that yin and yang maybe was a good, good marriage for you as, as, as guiding you through those years. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the things that I accomplished as a kid was because of that. You know, I mean, I had a lot. Again, I had physical abilities, but they, they expanded my vision of the potential I had and what I can do and, and a, a self-belief in myself that I can travel around the whole world by myself and just with some, you know, other uh, players my age and a coach and, and just fine. And that's what uh, I was able to accomplish and do. Yeah. So unlike, like Andre Agassi, who said his father was overbearing to a fault drove him to hate the game that he excelled in so much. You had a contrasting experience, although when your body broke down and your psyche was challenged, you had the ally of your family rather than, uh, the, rather than viewing it as a liability or as a detriment to your evolution as a player and as a person. Yeah, absolutely. 
absolutely. They are definitely the supportive ally. And, and, you know, where I'm at today is just because of that support. You mentioned the EFT, the emotional freedom technique, and we just had a talk with uh, one of the, uh, the the founding fathers of the program, Greg Warburton, who's a man who I know you you know very well. Tell me how that played into your recovery physically and psychologically from those early challenges. Um, well, I, I got into to know Greg and the tap and tapping and stuff while while I'd become a coach. So for me, the, the physical um, and mental therapy that I had really started in college after I left Pepperdine. So I transferred from Pepperdine completely burnt out, went to San Diego state and I had a coach there, John Nelson, that completely turned my, my mind around my way I viewed the world, the way I viewed tennis. Um, and it was through visualization. It was through meditation. It was through movement. And that was really the spark of a, a different way to, to be a different way to compete, a different way to play tennis um, which changed my whole life. And so that was, that was the time for me. Well, you got to expound upon that a bit, uh, Ryan. What was your old mindset and what was the new understanding and revelation? So the old mindset was feel. So when I felt good, I was going to play really well. And when I didn't, it was very frustrating and my game was off. And um, I, would, I would put that to a lack of discipline, a lack of mental discipline. And so when I, when I transferred from Pepperdine, it was just not a right fit for me. And when I transferred to San Diego State, and we started doing jujitsu, and we started um, uh, catching the ball, and we started throwing rackets rather than playing tennis, something in my mind said, okay, well, you know, what's going on here? And then to go out and start working on the game and learning discipline it created a ton of freedom for me. So what I started to do was I started to understand physics. I understand, started to understand my body and really how to let go. And what that did was it brought me to the moment. And so it was very, I became very present. I became very relaxed. I had a lot of freedom. And, you know, one thing that my coach would tell me at the time and that I use today is with feel comes confidence. The only way to get feel is to let go. The only way to let go is to get set up. And so we started to learn, or I started to learn how to set up, how to use my core, how to use my, you know, the core, the, uh, as, as Barry would say, the hara, you know, and that's what we started to focus on. So at 17 or 18 years old, now I'm starting to obsess with that. And so I had all this passion before, and I just fueled that passion into buying into this discipline that my coach was talking about. And it just, it was a whole new world. And yeah. That, yeah. yeah, tell me more about the discipline you're saying. What specifically are you referencing? So discipline of the moment, discipline of letting go. So pretty much controlling the controllables, being in the now and having a solution for whatever was going on. And when you can set up, for instance, for tennis, for the way we look at it, if we can set up up the line and Physically, we're set up with our body, and the way we say that is using our core, setting your body as if you can hit up the line. You physically put yourself in the best position to let go and go for any shot on the court. So now you're disguising the ball. Uh, you have the greatest amount of control to make the ball. And so really, to the core of it, we're setting up for every single ball. But it's just one ball, and it's over and over again. So you might have a 20-ball rally, but it's just one ball. And so by doing that, it's really, it's a meditation. It's a, it's a dance with your mind and you're connecting your body because I'm, I'm focusing on setting up. So my mind is telling my body to set up and we're setting up and then we're letting go. And it's like that when you hit, it's that connection and that connection that you feel when you're connected with the universe, with the ground, with gravity and your thought, that's where it was immediately, that's the discipline. And so now you have a solution when you're not disciplined and you've become disciplined, you know when you're not. And that's that language that you start to uh, understand and you start to, to speak in your own mind. Um, and again, it comes back to this freedom. So that's, that's really what happened to me at San Diego State. And within a semester of being completely burnt out and not knowing what I was doing playing this game to winning a national championship at that level. So a complete turnaround. Physics, uh, the talent was the same. The way I hit the ball was the same. The way I perceived how to compete was all within. 
and uh, it was it was amazing and it, it, i'm still writing on it today <laughs> that's awesome that's yes. great i want to hear more about that and i i understand you're a practitioner of yoga and it was it yogananda that you studied was that at the time you were making this uh, transformation as a player or be yeah. or was that after no that was during college you know um when i went to san diego state i, I started surfing a lot and um, I would start surfing, you know, before the sun was up. And so my day went, you know, surf before the sun was up, go to weights, go to class, practice, maybe go back and surf. And, and this one spot I used to surf a lot was Swami's. And that's where Yogananda had a, a uh, ashram. And I'd be surfing and I would see all the monks, you know, at sunrise meditating. And I just, like, what are they doing? I got, you know, I, I've... I've seen the power of visualization. I used it when I was younger to help heal my surgeries and stuff. And, um, and so I bought in and, and kind of secretly was going to the ashram a lot. Um, more so when things were really bad, um, you know, with tennis or struggles and stuff, that was kind of my place to go and feel safe. And then I would learn some meditation techniques and stuff. And it really just started to get stronger and started. I got more involved. Um, and, um, and so by the time I was out of college, I was, you know, I was fully in, in that philosophy and that mindset. And, and at that time, though, I still hadn't connected tennis and, and the mindset of what I was practicing with visualization and meditation. And um, so that was early on there. Now, you said you secretly went to your sanctuary. Were you afraid of the, the backlash or being ostracized or being characterized in, in some way that was not going to be acceptable by your, by your peers? Um, yeah. I mean, even for myself, you know, is going to uh, a yoga ashram to meditate and, and going to the, the beautiful gardens and just sitting there and just contemplating. And that's what it was. It was just reflecting and being able to have that space. And that was a space that, you know, I didn't tell anybody I was going to, because, you know, at that time, I think, you know, being ashamed of, you know, a tournament or a loss or something like that, that was the place to go for me. And then, you know, as I started surfing more and, um, and my coach at the time had us doing a lot of meditation before practices, before matches and stuff. And, and I was completely bought in. So with the, the taste of success with discipline and seeing how my, my mind was working with visualization and seeing that, you know, I just kept going back to it and it was working. So in your visualizations and your meditations, what were you focusing on or what was your concentration on? Yeah, so when I was doing it with the team and my coach, it was visualizing myself playing tennis, uh, visual, visualizing my body relaxing. Um, so kind of putting myself and seeing the way I wanted to see myself on the court. And it worked really well, you know. So it was just kind of like that uh, – um, inner game of tennis where you're seeing yourself too out there, you know, that's what we were practicing at the ashram. It was more devotional. It was, it was bhakti. It was uh, on faith. It was on God. Um, and it was also learning on breathing techniques and controlling your heart rate and your breath and stuff. Um, so I had a combination of two. Um, and it wasn't until really in this last year and after going to the, uh, the festival this last summer, really understanding who those things are connected and um, mm -hmm. so from, you know, throughout my 20s, it was I knew of this power and I had this devotion about it. And then I have this great understanding of discipline with tennis. And so I've been kind of, you know, juggling on how to offer those to other people and to, and to be myself and be unique and authentic that way. Well, that's awesome. And uh, I guess the results prove that you're on the right path. You talk about the spiritual connection to life and your game as though they are inextricably tied or indiscernible. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The game is your life. Your life is your game, right? I mean, they are they're one. They are one. Yeah, yeah. And, and that, that's how I see it, you know. And um, Scott Ford, you know, he's written some things about, you know, sport and spirituality that – uh, you know, to me, it gives me goosebumps just because I, you know, it's like, wow, yes, other people think like this. And, you know, Pete Carroll, I've gotten to talk to him and listen to him. And, he, you know, he talks about that. And, and it's so true. You know, it's, 
it's spiritual. When you're disciplined and you're out there and you're competing and you're, um, you know, connecting within to do these amazing things with your body, that's what you're doing when you're meditating. You know, I was in India doing 14 hour meditations. Like it was nothing. And it's the same as when you play a, you know, a three hour match and you're constantly in the moment and you're constantly in the moment. And, um, you know, I've had some great mentors, you know, Dr. Glenn Alba um, has been a mentor since I moved here to Stockton and, and he's been, you know, just kind of helping guide me that, yes, that's, that's what this is all about. You know, that the inner game is there. And, um, and so, you know, now here we are and, and I've been doing a lot of work with Greg Warburton, like you said, and kind of going back to that tapping, um, he's just been, he's been great for, for me as a coach and for the program, um, uh, and leading these guys to, to go within and have this resource, um, this physical resource that connects to their, their being as they compete. Now, did I hear you correctly say that you spent 14 hours a day in an ashram in India meditating? Uh, yeah, I've done, you know, 14 hours. We've done a lot, um, you know, before, back in the day. And um, that was actually my first, um, the connection with tapping and EFT, my first experience of it was in India. I was um, actually on a boat going down the Ganges River. And I was starting to have this terrible migraine. And there was an, another devotee there on the boat. And she, she could see it and she asked me what's going on. And I told her and she said, okay, come here, sit down. And, and I sat down in front of her and she started tapping. She started tapping on my, my, my head chakra, my head and my heart. And for about five minutes and it was gone. And if you've ever had a migraine or you know about migraines, I mean, they're terrible. They take you out. And it was literally gone. And I was just like, oh my goodness, what is this? And it wasn't until this past uh, summer when, I, you know, Glenn Alba had known those experiences of mine. He said, hey, I want you to meet a friend of mine. And uh, that's where he introduced me to Greg. And we immediately hit it up. And, and I said, listen, I know how powerful this is. I believe in it. And I want to know more about it. And I want my guys. And I want to know and understand how it works. And so that's where that relationship with tapping and EFT started. Right. Well, I just happened to do our SEC podcast with Greg Warburton, and he talked about energy psychology and, and all the things that you're referencing there. So you really were a sponge. You really soaked it all up. And no, thankfully, I'm not familiar with migraines. Was it something that you had had before and it was a chronic issue or was that a rare, you know, aberrant kind of experience? No, it's, it's something I was born with. I think it's hereditary. You know, it have, on my mother's side of the family, they get migraines. And so, unfortunately, I get them, and they're, they're pretty bad. Yeah, but now you have a way of treating the onset of the symptom, I gather. Yeah, absolutely. I, any, with tapping any injury, um, physical, mental, spiritual, I mean, you have, you have a resource, you have a tool, a technique to, to help guide that and, and prevent it. Well, Ryan, you know, you've done so much in the sport. And as you coach young players today, and, and you've been acknowledged and honored in so many ways, and, and congratulations to you. Tell me about your experience on the other side, because for so long you were the student, and now the roles are reversed in the last few years for you. Yeah. Yeah, in 2010, I became a head coach here at San Diego at University of the Pacific after being um, the assistant at San Diego State. Um, you know, I was done playing. I finished my degree in religious studies, and I wanted to become a professor. And I said, you know, uh, I'm teaching. I'm, I'm not here teaching on the court while I'm coaching. And so I started to see that the things that I knew, the things that I, that I saw worked for me, um, were, were working for my players. Um, and uh, it, it's been an amazing experience. And, and to be able to to offer something I think is a little different than most coaches are offering. It's a little kind of out there. It's still, you know, I think people probably think I'm crazy with some of the stuff we're doing here. Actually, uh, we had a tournament here a couple of weeks ago and I was on the court with one of my players and uh, he was struggling and you could see the tension boiling. 
And, you know, he was starting to get discouraged. And I pulled him to the side and I said, we, we did a protocol that Greg has worked with us with um, being honest. It's all about honesty, self-honesty. And I said, listen, you need to be honest right now. You need to be honest with where you're at. You need to tap while you're doing it. And then you need to tell yourself what you're going to do about it. And he literally, he did the tapping and you can see this weight go off his shoulders and it was just relaxed. And he just relaxed. And all of a sudden, he's playing free. All of a sudden, he's hitting winners. All of a sudden, he's back in his quote unquote zone or what whatnot. And, uh, and I, I look up in the stands and there's some other teams there and stuff. And there was a, a player like looking at his fingers and, and tapping his face and going, What's, what is that guy doing? <laughs> but um, it's been amazing. You know, we've had uh, one success after another results wise, but also just the guys understanding themselves and understanding how to compete internally. And uh, the whole basis of our program is competing, but that could be daunting. That could be a, you know, a lot of pressure, but bringing the honesty with EFT and, and tapping um, has been an unbelievable tool that I've been given as a coach that I'm able to offer, um, you know, along with a lot of the other stuff we do with visualizing and reflecting and stuff. Right. So what Greg talks about, Greg Warburton, is that acknowledging, as you point out, the, the struggle of the pain, the moment, is a bit of a purge. He, he likened it to a gardening hose that hadn't been used all winter, and you turn it on to water the plants, and a lot of gunk and junk comes out initially, and then the free flow. So you replace one, you know, the, the, the stuff that you want to purge, if you will, and, and, and ultimately you clear the mind and clear the way for the positive thinking to emerge. But you can't skip a step, or you can't, you know, you can't not get rid of that first negative thought or not get rid of it. You first have to address it and acknowledge it to get to the next step, to get to the next phase. And I think that's what you're, you're sharing with us. Yeah, absolutely. And especially with, you know, guys 18 to 21 years old, they're student athletes. They have, they have tons of issues, right? They have class, they have stresses. And at the same time, a division one program, that they're, you know, really wanting to do well and they really love this program. They want everything for it. And so the amount of stress that they have on them um, and then to come out and say, hey, you need to be at your best. You need to be mentally tough. You need to be tougher. You need to be, you know, X, Y, and Z. It just adds to it, you know. And now the, the stance we're taking is come out. Where are you? You know, and that's okay. You know, so the awareness is growing and the more individuals are aware of themselves and the more they're aware of what's going on, they, they have some uh, action they can take. They know what they're doing. They, they're disciplined, you know, they're free. And like you said, that first step is just admitting. Uh, and I think in high performance in anything, you know, too often times we're telling ourselves we're doing the right things. Well, I'm doing the right things and trying really hard. That doesn't mean that we're going to be successful. Um, you're not just given success, right? But when you can go out there and say, I'm really frustrated, well, that's okay. You know, and you can, okay, you're going to be frustrated. That's fine. That's where you can start. That's where all that gunk is. And from there, I mean, time after again, when I ask these guys to just be honest and then tap, you can just see the eyes relax. You can see the body relax. And I think that the, all the studies I've done of, the zone and flow and all that stuff, it's when there's no tension, you know, and there's a, a real stillness and a real love um, for competing and for just sh striving to, to be your best. And right. so that's what it's brought about. And we've had some amazing successes. We've had two guys get to the finals of a, a pro tournament that is huge for a college athlete. And they're literally on the sideline tapping, you know, and they're telling themselves, well, I'm really nervous right now, but this is, I'm going to do my best here. And they're going out and, and the sport, the, the tennis aside is just being played and the, the psychology is there and they're very free. And it's an amazing, that's the spirituality in my mind that these guys are doing. And, you know, I don't say, Hey, you're, you know, got to believe in God or anything, but this is a spiritual moment you're, you're, you're experiencing right now. And, um, 
you know, it's not for everybody, but it's working for us. <laughs> well, great. No, hey, no question about it. It probably is for everybody if they could tune into it or embrace it or be open yeah, to so. it. <laughs> you know, but it, it's okay. I mean, w when it's right, the teacher will emerge for the student. Yeah. Now, how about the idea that Greg Warburton talks about in his energy psychology, that the brain can condition the body to do good, bad, or indifferent, that the power is in the mind and the body is just the manifestation of the mental process. And that's, I think, at the essence of all this. Yeah. Yeah, and competitively, absolutely. You know, when, when uh, a player has nerves and when they're tight uh, and they have these thoughts of, say, result-oriented thinking that they have to win or all these kind of things, you see it. It manifests in their body with tight shoulders, with uh, very lethargic um, movements. Um, it rarely is successful when, when you see that in somebody. And so... Um, you know, the, the EFT of connecting the brain, the right and left side of the brain, and connecting them um, as part of that protocol that he teaches beforehand, it really does balance things out. And again, goes back to this tensionless um, body that, um, that the brain is, is, is controlling. And, and not just the brain and the head, but, you know, the, the brain of the heart, the brain of, the, of your core. You know, a big part of our, of our teaching here is moving from your core. When your core moves, it's, it's kind of thinking for itself, um, and you're setting up. And so it's all connecting right there. And the balance is there. And um, so it's, it's all together. It's all manifest together. It's all integrated. Um, and I think that's the, you know, I, I like to say we're really not just teaching tennis here. It's a, it's a holistic approach to the game that they're then going on off the court, hopefully taking with them. Barry Robbins, who you alluded to earlier, is speaking about the hara, that point just beneath the belly button, the core, is referred in some, re in some people's minds and some scientists would refer to it as the second brain or that gut feeling. Well, there are a lot of neurotransmitters in that hara, in that core center of our being, which can kind of guide us in many ways and that gut feeling. And if we can get right to the core of our, our, our understanding and being, it can manifest in our physical expression. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, the, I, I completely agree with that. And, and, you know, I've sat through one of his courses and where he talks about that science to it. Um, but I mean, even before this, you know, I had butterflies. I was nervous to do this podcast and that's okay. right. It's right in the core, you know, and, and then to, to go into it and, and acknowledge it and be aware of it. Um, yeah, it's, it's, telling, it's telling our brain up here a lot about what's going on. You know, it's not necessarily the other way around. Um, and that's why I think that you know, a practice like yoga where you're, you know, a lot of meditation is on this, the third chakra there. Um, Jiu-jitsu, you know, when I, again, when going back to when I was 18 and, you know, instead of, practicing tennis, we're rolling around on the mat, learning to move our core and get out of certain moves and throws and stuff just by our core. You start to really understand that's, that's like the center, that's the center of our world. And, right. um, and I think a lot of sports, all sports, um, uh, most things are centered around that balance and that we have to have that balance. Now, speaking of balance, you referred earlier to your burnout when you were a teenager and your recovery and comeback stronger and better, what would you suggest to parents or coaches of young athletes who are potentially facing similar situations? I mean, are you looking to diversify in the, in the sports program that don't just be in one sports in the full immersion, or is it more multifaceted as you've outlined in talking about a spiritual connection and meditation and, and other, and other uh, forms of, uh, you know, and other endeavors to avoid or not to, not to avoid the burnout, but to have a better appreciation to, uh, on your path. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, I've got children myself and, and my oldest son is uh, doing all the sports right now. Um, and when I look back, um, you know, I did martial arts as a kid as well and, and surf some, but I didn't play too many sports because tennis was everything. Um, 
but I don't think if I played other sports that would make a difference, but I do think that integrating a holistic path for athletes, for artists, for musicians, and having them understand um, the connection of the mind and their craft is, is huge. It, I don't probably wouldn't have that burnout, maybe. I don't know. Um, had I known that or had I had communication with that. And I think that's what we're starting to see nowadays. Um, like 10, 15 years ago when lifting weights wasn't a big thing in tennis or other sports, now it's in every sport. The psychology, the, um, the uh, awareness um, of the mind and the, connected to the movement, connected to strategy and competing is going to be the next next movement that we start to see everybody knowing about. That's my hope. That's what I think where we're going. Um, that's why for me going to the uh, SEC festival was, you know, I had tears, you know, days after because it felt like I have a communication now, you know, and, and when you, like I was saying before, when I understood the discipline and when I bought in and, and I was disciplined and connected, I can talk to my coach about it and maybe one other teammate, but I couldn't talk to anybody else about it. You know, and um, now there is dialogue, there is communication going around uh, at the SEC festival and the, uh, um, you know, the devotees to say of that kind of thought, right. you know, that, you know, like myself, like Glenn Albaugh has been a huge um, influence for me to, to be me and to say, yes, no, this is the way, this is the way to the next step of, of mastery. Um, and, you know, that's, that's where, that would be my recommendation um, is that coaches start to integrate that in their practices. Don't just go out and feed balls, you know, tap into the mind, tap into feelings. I mean, you know, it sounds to me even to talk about it, but just to, to ask, how are you feeling? Be honest with yourself. When you ask yourself these questions and you're honest, how does that make you feel? Making you feel was not okay when I was younger, <laughs> you know, it's, you better be tough. And so I think we're going to create stronger individuals on the court, uh, in the pool, in the business office, et cetera, by being able to really tap into the authenticity of um, the human. Who would have imagined that 20 years after your so-called burnout, it would be an impetus and a catalyst to the wisdom, insights, and successes that you've experienced in the years that follow? Yeah, I know. Yeah, I'm very grateful for that. You know, I think I didn't, I didn't get to play professionally too long. I had a lot of injuries myself, but, you know, it was all because of where I'm at now. I'm able to um, help. I like to, like to start to say the word mentor rather than coach. Um, these kids, these guys, you know, and, and people to, to understand these things at a deeper level. And, um, you know, we're starting to see some of the players that have graduated from our program you know, go on and, and are having professional careers um, on the pro tour with this mindset, you know, uh, integrated into their, into their being. And so it's working and um, it's all worth it. You know, everything has a, to me, everything has a purpose and it has a reason why it happened. And so this is, uh, I'm definitely blessed and, and excited to, to be on this journey. I feel like I'm very in the infancy of it, you know, um, with the mindset, with, uh, awareness and acceptance and, um, and, and tapping and, and all those things that we practice here at Pacific. Um, you know, there's so much more and it's, it's really exciting. And, and I'm, 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 you know, I'm just pumped to, to continue to learn every day. Well, congratulations on all your success and continue to pass that wisdom along. And you, sir, are the essence of the Omni athlete. Oh, thank you very much. It's a, uh, it's an honor to even be called that. So, yes, yeah, it's been a pleasure. Been a pleasure. You.